ربنا هب لنا من أزوادنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم My dear respected elders, my brothers, my sisters, my young ones Alhamdulillah by the father of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is our first lesson under the banner of Dars al-Yawm Dars al-Yawm meaning lesson of the day And it's my pleasure to be able to share this moment with you Um being that this is our first lesson i think it's very important we start um at a significant place and the basics of islam the very basic i think is the most important part for our first lesson it's actually extremely surprising at how many people are not aware of some of the basic elements of islam for example taking a bath according to the sharia according to the rules of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like everything in life there is a, a way to do things or a correct way a process and if things are done according to that process then we can achieve maximum benefit many people don't realize that in islam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set a procedure or a method for literally everything from going to the toilet, going for a bath, for a shower, or being with your partner, whether it be husband or wife, method of eating. So there is a lesson in, in Islam for literally everything. And if done the correct way, number one, we gain thawab, which is hasanat, ajr, and also we, we gain that benefit from Allah because everything Allah has done has a benefit for the dunya, for currently, and also for the akhirah. Akhirah meaning it's a rewarding act But for the dunya it has some kind of a benefit Which may later on be proven by science We start off today's lesson with a quotation from Sahih Muslim In which the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said At-tahuru shatrul iman At-tahuru shatrul iman Literally means that purity or cleanliness Is half of your iman Half of your deen, half of your religion, half of your faith so purity, cleanliness is half of our faith and this hadith refers to many things physical purity, mental, spiritual purity but today we're sticking to the outwardly, outwardly aspect of purity meaning physical purity and cleanliness I'm going to quote another hadith here from Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Bukhari, the very first hadith in book 1, volume number 1, hadith number 1 and I'm just going to quote half of it because only half of it at this moment is relevant to us. In fact, all of it can be, but half is sufficient for our need. And that hadith is, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ So actions are based on intentions. So we can do something without making an intention. And the task may be accomplished. We may accomplish our goal. But we will not get the thawab or the hasanat or the ajr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give normally for those who make the intention specifically. Many people do say that the act is um, part of the intention as well and that is true in certain respects but the Prophet sallallahu has highlighted in the first hadith of Bukhari Sharif, the first book after the Quran that actions are based on intentions. That, that means that making an intention is, is very very important. So regarding bathing or bathing, how should we make an intention? Basically, if we look at it this way, that, um, Oh Allah, I intend to perform a bath. And this is an example. To become clean for you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that I can worship you. Now just imagine whether I'm sitting, relaxing, sleeping, eating, walking. I will be getting hasanat, thawab, rewards, ajr. Because I'm in the pure state of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even when I'm not praying my salah, reading my Quran, or doing my azkar, I'm still getting thawab and hasanat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I'm in a pure state for the sake of Allah. So every second that I'm in that clean, pure state for Allah, I'm getting rewarded because I'm still doing something for Allah even if I'm not doing, meaning if I'm not doing anything else. Okay. So far we've learnt being clean is half of our iman, half of our faith, and making an intention is very important in Islam. 
there's another hadith or a part of a hadith um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said Man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni Man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni The one who rejects or shuns or turns away from my sunnah is not from me The one who rejects or shuns turns away from my sunnah is not from me and this teaches us how important the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually is. If we can, there are many people out there that actually say, oh, don't worry about this, it's only a sunnah. From this we can actually understand that the sunnah is of the utmost importance in our religion. And they, I, I don't think there could be a bigger insult to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than saying, don't worry about this, it's only a sunnah. There's nothing, no such thing as only a sunnah. The sunnah is one of the, the foundations of our iman, of our religion. And without the sunnah, we would not be able to be Muslims. We would not be able to perform Islam. Okay? So, we've learnt uh, three ahadith right now. And now I'm going to explain to you that we should perform our ghusl or our bath according to the method taught to us by the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first thing we do is we make the niyyah, the intention of ghusl. We then recite tasmiyah, meaning bismillah rahman rahim or bismillah. And just to point out, there are actually three faraid, three compulsory acts, three, three required acts in, in performing a bath in the ghusl. Number one is to pass water in and out of the mouth, gargling as well. Number two is passing water through our nostrils, cleaning the inside of our nose. And number three is passing water over the entire body. Now here we have to ensure that not a single area, not a single place the size of our head is left dry. Otherwise our salah will be void, meaning it will not be completed. And we have to repeat the salah, especially when we're in the need of ritual bath. If we've, if we've been with our husband or wife, if you know, in the state of period or nifas. Um, so in these situations, we need to be very, very careful, especially, in fact, in all situations, we have to be careful, but these times when we are in need of a bath, our bath is not um, complete, okay? There are five acts which are considered as sunnah. So Allah has given us three points that we have to follow. The, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has um, stressed upon five points which we should follow or method that we should follow number one is washing the hands up to the wrists first the right side then the left number two is washing the private parts front and back and anywhere that we could have some kind of impurities najasa and so on and so forth number three would be washing the hands again number four would be making wudu then number five will be passing water over the whole body three times, preferably cover uh, three times, but covering every aspect and every part of the body. Now, I'll just go over some basic rules on uh, performing the ghusl. But before I do that, just to explain that these are, I explained the hadith regarding the importance of being clean, the hadith regarding the importance of making an intention and niyyah, and the importance of hadith regarding the importance of following a sunnah. I explained the faraid, the compulsory acts of ghusl, and I explained the sunnah acts of ghusl, the method in which the Prophet said we have to follow. I'll go into these in detail in a few minutes. There's one point I'd like to mention here. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the salaf salihin, the sahaba tabi'in, tabi tabi'in, they used to wear loincloths, you could say like a skirt, just for understanding purposes, um, which would cover the private parts front and back and the Prophet used to wash under that to wash himself clean because it's frowned upon to actually be naked. It's not haram. Nobody's saying it's haram. It's not, I would, I don't know, under makuru whether it is or it isn't, differences of opinion and we're not getting into fiqh matters. But the point is the Prophet used to wear a little cloth to cover the private areas during his bath as well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we can consider it following a sunnah, and something that will bring us great reward, great hasanat, if we were to follow that procedure. Okay, some rules whilst performing our ghusl. Ghusl should be made in total privacy, place of total privacy, not where anybody could see us. We should not face the Kaaba whilst performing our ghusl. 
Um, it is preferable to be seated, but if we have showers and we're standing, it's not haram or makru, we can stand as well. We should use enough water, that means we should not waste water and we shouldn't be cheap with our water. Okay, we should use enough water to clean ourselves. We should try not to speak whilst um, performing ghusl. If somebody's um, calling or shouting to us, as if it's necessary, then we should reply, otherwise we should remain quiet. It is some people like to sing in the shower in the bath. This is actually haram. It's not acceptable in the Sharia. It's not allowed. So we should remain quiet and we should not read any kind of ayah, ayat of Quran or any um, surahs from the Quran. Now I'll go into further detail on the actual act. Um, how exactly the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to perform his ghusl. So number one, we make the niyyah. Then we recite the tasmiyah, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim We wash both hands up to the wrists um, three times right, three times left. We wash the private parts front with the left hand, then the back with the left hand. And we ensure that any state of najasa, any, any impurities on our body is washed off at this point, any filth. We then wash our hands again, um, right and left, and then continue to the wudu, which is putting water in our mouth, washing our mouth, our nostrils with the left hand, our nose, our face from the top hairline to the to our chin, from the right ear to the left ear, and including if we have beards, then including our beards inside, making khilal of the beard. Okay. Washing our arms as well three times, right and left. Now this is the aspect done. If we're gonna use shampoo, shower gels, toothbrushes, toothpaste, now would be the best time to use those. And then we start to, to wash our head three times if using a bucket and cup, three times the right side, putting water over our body, three times the left side and then rubbing the entire body and washing the rest of the body. If we're using a shower, if we're having a shower, it doesn't matter about the three times as long as we're washing those areas properly. But the sunnah is head, right side, left side and then completely right all the way down. If the hairs of the head are not plaited, especially for women this is, then we have to wet all the hairs up to the roots. Um, if a single hair is left dry, then our ghusl is invalid, meaning it's not accepted, and we have to repeat it. So not a single hair can be left dry. Men generally don't plait their hair, so um, it's not relevant at this in these days, I don't think. But in any case, if a man does have a plait, then he has to open it. There is no law for him to just wash while his hair is plaited. If a woman's hair is plaited, she doesn't have to loosen the plait or open it, but she, it's compulsory for, it's wajib for her to wet the hair at the roots. The base of each hair should be wet. If she fails to wet every single hair, then the ghusl is not valid and it has to be repeated. As for the men, as I explained, there is no exception for them. They have to open the plait and they have to wash every single hair. Okay. If a woman cannot wash to the roots of the hair on her head, then she has to open a plait and wash the entire hair. It's must have preferable to clean the body by rubbing it. All parts should be rubbed with the hands to ensure the water reaches all parts of the body. No portion is left dry and all impurities are removed from the body. Regarding jewelry like rings, earrings, etc., these should be removed to ensure that no portion is covered by them no portion of skin. So for example, if you have a ring and water doesn't go under that ring, then your ghusl is not complete. It will be void and therefore incomplete. Okay. On completion of the ghusl, completion of your bath or shower, it's mustahab, it's better to wash the feet in a different place as a sunnah. The Prophet wasallam, especially due to ritual bath, ritual meaning uh, in the state of Janab and Najasa, meaning impurity, used to wash his blessed feet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam separately away from the area because when there's a puddle of water that pu puddle of water may be unclean and we're standing in that and think we've, we're clean we're fine and you know we just leave the bath and we don't realize that we're actually unclean or our feet were unclean okay the method of washing the feet again right foot three times up to the ankle and left three times up to the ankle using our little finger of our hand to go in between the toes and make sure the water reaches between the toes. We do the left the same manner as we do the right. We do the right side first. If after the performing of the ghusl, any 
portion is left dry, it is necessary to repeat the entire ghusl unless we are still wet and we can quickly get water and put it over that area. Passing your hand over that area is not enough. You have to put water over it. If we've forgotten to rinse our mouth and our nostrils and our body is still wet, we can rinse our mouth and gargle and rinse our nostrils and clean our nose, but only if our body is wet. If we're dry, we have to repeat the process again. Okay, this is the bath complete. We then recite Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. I bear witness or I testify that there is no god but Allah and he has no partners, he is one and the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the prophet and the and, and the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the next dua is Allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirin so in other words oh Allah make me from amongst those who repent tawabin those who make tawbah and from those who are mutatahhirin those who are pure those who are clean from here we can also observe that there is a link between cleanliness and forgiveness they go hand in hand they go together this is like a marriage we have to be clean in order for it to be forgiven I'm not saying this is literally the point, but you can see from this du'a that they do go hand in hand and, and there is a link between the two. So I hope inshallah today's lesson has been of benefit to people and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, accept our efforts, forgive our sins. So that's basically our first lesson and I think that covers everything in pretty much detail that we need without confusing matters and the next lesson I think will be on wudu itself and the benefits of wudu. Inshallah look forward to our second lesson. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa maghfirullah.